Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dan Bova at entrepreneur.com and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Quickly Increase Your E-Commerce Sales. Uh, with us today is e-commerce whiz, Andrew Mefetone. Andrew has over 15 years of experience in the space. He's the founder of Blue Tusker, a team that specializes in experts dedicated to the growth and success of e-commerce sellers. He's also one of the contributors of our book, Ultimate Guide to Shopify. And actually, uh, look in the chat. We're going to be offering a special discount code for anyone who's on this webinar. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Andrew's going to tell us all how to increase e-sales using a variety of marketing strategies across a variety of platforms. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Dan. Quite the... Uh... Quite the intro, I appreciate that. I hope that I can live up to half of what you just said, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Did I sell it too hard? Oh no, my dog is playing with a squeak toy. So Joe's sorry about working that. at home, man. <laughs> well, we've got uh, a ton to get to, and uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in here live and let you know that if you have questions, we've got a bunch of questions on tap, but we. Um, you know, put them in, put your questions in the question tab and uh, we'll get to as many as we can as we roll along. But Andrew, let's get started with sort of like a big picture question. So, uh, you know, I'm watching this webinar. I've got this product. I've got this thing. I've got this service that I make uh, and I want people to buy it. How do I reach people? How do I get people to know about and then purchase the thing I just made? Uh so very much i'm going to end up giving you a general answer to a pretty general question yeah um that's going to always come down to your product line specifically right like who is your actual customer who are you going after because i could sit here and tell you like oh google ads go do that but there's a ton of products out there where that general platform doesn't work very well at all i could tell you like oh you're going to want to start a tiktok channel but that may not work for everyone either so really what it comes down to is once you first decide, we're like, okay, here's what I want to sell. You know, here's how we're going to kind of, you know, uh, start to market this thing. You're going to want to figure out like, okay, who is going to buy this? Who's most likely to buy this? Where are they? And how do I get there? Most obvious, obviously why we're here being you want to make sure that you have at least one centralized location for them to go to nine times out of 10. That's your own website. Hence why we're talking about Shopify today. Um, a lot of other people also can start off on Amazon. Some kind of do more of an omni-channel approach where it's a mix of the two but it really is gonna come down to where is my audience? How do I get to where they are? And then how do I connect with that audience to then come to my website and obviously shop with me from that way? Great, so I guess the first question, and this might be obvious, but um, you know, how do you, what, do, what should you be asking yourself to determine where that audience is? Uh, you know, if you're in the beginning and you're just starting off and you have zero data to go off of, right? So let, if you've been around and you launched the store and you've got a little bit of traction, you can look into like Google Analytics and, and pull some of your data there on where your audience is. But if you haven't done anything yet, to me, that's always going to come down to figuring out the best way to do market research yourself. You could start off with just a general thought like, okay, based on my product, I think that we're going to do well on social media start a social media platform and do what you can, or platform, sorry, start a channel. Uh, don't start a platform, that's a whole nother webinar. Uh, <laughs> then basically go through, start to start to create content that's going to uh, kind of connect you with your community, right? So if I'm selling a bunch of hunting stuff, I might wanna start a social media platform that's just on hunting and start to develop content that way just to start to get that audience kind of going. Or if it's a completely different product line, figure out who's going to buy this thing. Go find the, that person. If you're like, oh, you know, I'm selling to restaurants or I'm selling to people that enjoy fishing, go stand outside a Bass Pro Shop and talk to someone. Go to a restaurant and ask them. It never hurts to ask. They always say in the beginning, you know, it's the hustle and you got to figure that stuff out. But if you're trying to bootstrap it, that's the easiest way to go. If you're not trying to bootstrap it and you're loaded with capital, just hire a market research firm and they'll do it for you. Right. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, that's great. And uh, I hope everyone out there is 
full of cash and able to do that. But if they're yeah. not, we're gonna we're gonna offer you some uh, some ways to do it in in a bootstrapping kind of way. So maybe we'll. Uh, so first of all, someone just asked if this will be recorded. Yes, it will be recorded and it'll be available to watch and rewatch uh, on Entrepreneur.com. Uh, so you talked about, you know, finding your audience. Now, uh, a lot of us are familiar with, um, SEO practices, uh, to improve, um, traffic going to our site, but, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about ways to use SEO to improve, uh, your organic revenue, not just traffic. So, so what do you mean by that? SEO has gotten a very interesting um, kind of reputation, especially lately now that there's the whole chat GPT thing, which makes it seem like, hey, I can just press a button and then all of a sudden there's a blog post and now I'm getting all this traffic, which is not how that works. But a lot of people, they'll start at, they'll start some kind of SEO strategy. They'll do it for like two or three months and then they'll be like, okay, this isn't working. SEO takes six, nine, 12 months before you start to see anything coming in. And because of that, it can be an investment in the long term, which means you're not making your revenue in the beginning. And so you've got to find ways to make it a lot more profitable, in, at least in the beginning, at least start off that way. So as things start to ramp up, you can see those sales trickle in. So one thing that I've always found uh, specifically with Shopify sellers that they tend to skip over is Shopify, you create a theme, you throw up, you know, all the imagery and all the fun stuff that you have. And then you have your blog and it just is the way it is. People write blogs and they'll think that they're doing SEO. But what they're missing out on is making sure that those blogs actually have conversion friendly features on them. So you can do the standard stuff. Make sure you're linking to your products. That'll help with the ranking of the product pages and all that. But Shopify even has some plugins where you can actually add uh, sections within the blog where you can add to cart directly from there. Or what you can do is I'm never going to suggest like, hey, put display ads like Google AdSense all over your blog because that's not the business anyone's in. But well, you guys are, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but you can make your own display ad where it looks like a display ad, but have it be an advertisement for a collection or for your own product and have that just be a clickable image that actually takes them over to the product. Anything that you can kind of do to showcase the actual shopping capability on the site outside of the blog because blogs are very top of funnel right people are searching for an answer to a question or they're searching for something and they're not exactly ready to buy yet because if they were you'd probably be running google ads on those types of terms but if they're looking for an answer to a question you can pull in that like-minded audience and then showcase all the different aspects of your business that you could try to get them to convert within the blog or your backup plan which is to have some kind of gated content, whether it's an ebook or a webinar or some kind of checklist, or you know, you have the standard, which is on like the sidebar. You can do like, hey, 10% off your first order with a pop-up and all that stuff. So there's a ton of other ways, but really what it comes down to is making sure that if you're going to have an SEO strategy, make sure that you have something for them to do when they get there besides just read your blog. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great, and you and you mentioned you know uh, various downloads where you be can capture people's emails, um, which uh, kind of brings us to email marketing. Um, you know, in your experience, uh, what do you think are the best automated email campaigns to improve your revenue, but also to keep people coming back so they don't become blind to your emails? You know, what what are your best strategies for that? So. Email marketing is, I feel like it's really well known that it's one of the best marketing options that you have for as an e-commerce seller. And yet it never shocks me that it's usually the most underutilized. It's yeah. the least expensive way to get revenue, especially once you start to bring in that audience and, and once you want to get them back in your funnel and get them coming back. But you have your standard stuff, right? So you have like an abandoned cart abandoned checkout, which are relatively similar, but basically someone gets to the cart or they get all the way to the checkout, but then they don't pull the trigger. So you just automate emails going to them. At that point, you need to make sure you already have their email. So that's where some of those gated content things will definitely come into play. You have your browser abandonment, which is maybe they came to the site and didn't can, didn't do anything, and but they've shopped with you before. And you can do one of those things where you automate an email to them. It's like, hey, I saw you were poking around. How can I help kind of thing? You can make it very customer service oriented with terminology like I just did, or you can make it like a, we saw you on the site and here's a cool discount for you, like something along those lines where it's more marketing side. Then you have like customer win back, 
they've shopped with you, but it's been a while since they've shopped with you. So it's after, you know, X amount of time, you automate an email. Then you have your welcome series. Someone just signed up for a newsletter or they filled out a pop-up to get 10% off their first order or whatever. So you can send them down a whole drip campaign that way. You then have your new customer. So someone who has shopped with you for the first time, you want to send them a thank you, like really kind of oversell it and make sure that they're really happy with the purchase. You don't want anyone with like, you know, kind of that post-purchase depression that they shouldn't have bought it or something like that. So it kind of reiterates that. Then you have the repeat customer, which is you came back. So you liked working with us last time. We want to thank you. You could do a discount. You could just just thank them if you want to go that way. There's a whole different, that kind of depends on the approach you want to take. You could be one of those brands that offers a discount for everything all the time. You could be one of those brands that rarely has a discount. And you just want to thank them. But then you've got like, uh, let's see, what else? You have your sunset email, which is you haven't really engaged with us in a while. So we're just going to be like, hey, we'd love for you to come and engage with it. You haven't opened an email. You haven't been to the site. You haven't done anything. After a while, you can have that automatically unsubscribe them. That'll keep your list clean so that that way you're not getting spammed or anything along those lines. It'll keep your open rates looking nice. Then you have replenishment stuff. If you have a, uh, let's say you're consumable and you are got something that you need to order every 60 days, you could trigger that email every 60 days. Really what it comes down to when you're thinking about auto emails is, A, there's a ton of lists out there that you can just be like, okay, these are all great ideas. This can work. But you can also just sit back and look at the at your audience and go, every time they do something, anything at all, that could be a trigger to trigger out an auto email or an SMS or however you want to do that. But there's every time you can set that stuff up, it's one less thing that you have to do because it's automated. You don't have to sit there and send out an email every time someone does something. Right. And I was just about to say, you know, uh, those are all like incredible ideas and it could sound overwhelming. Like, how am I going to do all that? But the idea is <laughs> this is automated. <laughs> you're not going to do yeah, all it once. You're done. Right. right. You got to test them and all that fun stuff. But, uh, and also there's the standard stuff, right? You're abandoned cart, your welcome series, maybe new customers, super standard. They're quick and painless. Uh, like, Obviously, we're here talking about Shopify. So a big email uh, platform is Klaviyo. It's like we're Klaviyo partners. We set up a new Klaviyo account, abandoned cart, welcome series, new customer. That's it. Let's start there, get that up and running. And then after a while, like, okay, how do we build this out? How do What else needs to go here? And then you start to figure out like, okay, my, uh, let's take your um, your welcome series. The first email that they get has a pretty nice open rate and you can see you're getting a decent amount of revenue from it. Why not add a second one? So now maybe two or three days later, let's send another one. And then you just wait a little while and you read the data. Are you getting good open rates still? Are they engaging? Are they clicking? Are they purchasing again? In which case, like, okay, let's wait two or three days and send them another one. In which case you just continue to expand on them, but it's not going to happen overnight. This is, e-commerce is long gone uh, the days of, let me put a product on the internet and then I'm going to retire and you know not have to do it after two years. That's not the case. There's, I'm not giving anyone advice on how to be rich overnight. If I, if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be doing this. I would have done it already. I'd, I'd be, I would have retired. Well, Andrew, I was kind of counting on that. Damn. I know. Um, I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I realized we, we maybe skipped a step for some of the people who are watching this, but you know, a lot of people get started by selling on Amazon. You know, that it's uh, a pretty simple way to get started. But you mm -hmm. know, what about What's your advice for 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 expanding from there, from moving from just you have a listing on Amazon to diversify, build your own website? Like, how should people approach that? Okay, I love this one. Stay with me. This is one of my favorite things to talk about because every time I tell e-commerce sellers, like, here's how you can diversify away from Amazon, they always get really mad at me. And it's my favorite <laughs> thing. It's my favorite thing to have a conversation about. Because a lot of times they're like, why would I want to leave Amazon? That's where I make most of my money and blah, blah, blah. Look at the end game. If you're an FBA seller on Amazon, right? So you're selling your product, it's prime, they can get it in two days. If you're going to exit, your valuation, if you're sub $10 million a year, is probably at two or three X EBITDA. If you actually have your own uh, brand off Amazon, you have your own audience, so you have a social following, maybe you have a website that's getting a good amount of organic traffic, you have a good size email list, all that fun stuff. You can actually exit closer to a four to six, even closer to like a seven to eight X EBITDA sometimes, depending on your product line and what you're looking for. 
So it's a significantly higher valuation as opposed to just Amazon because you have no control of your data. You have no control over anything. However, just like we talked about in the beginning, most e-commerce sellers are bootstrapping. They're not going through and doing a whole round of funding. Most of them are just bootstrapping. So my suggestion, get your brand registered on Amazon, right? You build out a storefront that looks like what you want your website to potentially look like. Do sponsored brand ads, which are the ads on Amazon that allow you to drive traffic to the storefront. And just see if you can get those ads to convert. If they convert, you've proven that your storefront can bring in traffic and can get it to convert. From there, now what you can test before you create a website, before you do anything else, review your product. Is it a is it better searched? So they usually the way I look at it is is uh, the people that are buying your product are they aware a solution exists and you're you're the solution or are they not aware of a solution and they have a problem in which case that would be social media because you have to educate them a little bit more before they get anywhere. So let's say we figure out which one that is. Google and or Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever direction you go in, take that, drive your traffic directly to that storefront. You've already proven that the storefront can convert from your traffic on Amazon. Now what we want to see is can that off Amazon traffic convert on the storefront as well? You, Amazon doesn't talk to Google or Facebook or anything like that. So it's not going to know if they converted, but there's a source code in the back end of Amazon that can actually tell you based on this campaign you ran from Google or from Facebook, here's how many people converted. You can also do Amazon's affiliate program or the associates program, whatever they call it now, and you can do it that way where you can track all your sales. Once you've been able to prove, okay, my off Amazon traffic will convert on Amazon, now just build a landing page. Don't go putting your entire product line on a Shopify site because the one thing that I find most Amazon sellers really mess up on is when they go to create their own Shopify store, they grab a quick theme, they throw you know a handful of stock images up on there, they just put it up and then they go, off Amazon doesn't work, this is why I don't wanna do this, it's not going well, blah, blah. The themes can work well, but if, they're gonna, if you're gonna use it correctly, you still gotta customize it a little bit, you gotta invest in the content and it can be costly. So my usual suggestion is start to build that audience, develop your own landing page, Give them the option to still go to Amazon if you want. You can actually put a button on those landing pages that say like available on Amazon. And Amazon's obviously helping with this now because Amazon has the buy with Prime button. So there's a ton of ways that you can do that. But you can actually start to gain, like start pixeling the people that are coming to your landing page. If they're buying from you on the landing page, grow that list. If you're doing social media, grow the social media following. Then just let it bake for a little while. Justify your off Amazon revenue and then take that profit and invest in building out a website, then focus on building the brand. So it's a nice way to kind of ease into getting off Amazon without just jumping into some you know, tens of thousands of dollars website and then having to run tens of thousands of dollars of ads and it doesn't do well because you're missing all the social proof. You don't have uh, any reviews or anything on your site. So it's probably not gonna convert well in the beginning anyway. That's great. And uh, uh, speaking of, of social, um, we just had a question come in from Lori Turk, who wants to know, uh, what is one of the best social media sites for advertising an impulse purchase product? Ooh. It would be kind of dependent on what the impulse purchase is, but if it's like the stuff my wife buys, <laughs> Instagram, <laughs> TikTok. That's the easiest thing. Or the only other thing you can think of would be Facebook. To me, it's becoming like the Microsoft of the internet for social media, where it's like mostly an older audience now, or it's people that are in like Facebook groups. Instagram is still a good one and viable. And if TikTok doesn't, you know, if it starts getting banned more and more like it is right now, then Instagram's going to get back to where it was before. TikTok's a little bit younger, but for an impulse purchase of like, oh, this looks cool, I kind of want this thing. Quick, uh, you know, easy ads or great content on Instagram or TikTok, or your other option is Pinterest. Pinterest does really well for apparel and like home goods and stuff like that. That's another one where you can, depends on what the actual product is, but those are usually the, my top three for impulse buys. Uh, that's great, that's great. Um, uh, well, so uh, another question then is, uh, and I know this is going to vary from platform to platform, but um, do you have kind of some um, some rails for people to follow when it c 
comes to structuring a social media advertising campaign? Uh, you know, what are the best practices? And maybe if you want to pick, uh, you know, Instagram as the example, you know, which, whichever platform you think is the best. So social media advertising took a big change when Apple did the whole iOS thing, like what, like two or three years ago at this point. And what basically what happened there was the way I always explain it is uh, let's use Facebook as an example, because that's where most people were at that time, had up to 180 days worth of data to work with. So if you visited someone's website, Facebook knew about it for up to 180 days and would use that data against you to run ads to you, right? So a lot of people would run what was called lookalike audiences. It was basically saying like, hey, of this 180 days worth of data, here's, here's the data for you, Facebook. Now go find me 1% of the entire US market that looks just like that, right? Well, the problem was is after iOS, that got shut down to seven days. And so that's way less data than what Facebook had to work with. So lookalike audiences became horrible. They just didn't do well, unless you were a big enough company with you know, enough emails or enough visitors or something like that that did well. So now what actually is working is leveraging Facebook's first party data. So you wanna create a, you know, a piece of content that looks really great, which you probably wanted to do anyway in the beginning. And if you can do a video, and then what you wanna do is you wanna have, uh, you wanna run an ad for traffic or landing page views. So you just wanna get people to the site. As soon as someone clicks, Facebook keeps that data. That's their data, that's their first party data. They know about it and you can retarget those people. So you can retarget people that clicked, you can retarget people that watched a video for X amount of time, you can retarget people that commented, liked, anything along those lines, and you can stay in front of them for up to 365 days. So you have even more data than you used to. It was just, it wasn't an approach people used to use because it's a lot more of like top of funnel. And now it's kind of like you set up the top of funnel within Facebook and then you just set up real nice retargeting. So you maybe you retarget them for seven days and then you change it up for seven to 14 and then 14 to 21, you can change it up. But from a social media advertising side, use Facebook against them. And it's the same thing with TikTok and Pinterest, the whole approach because iOS was across the board. The only other thing that I always caveat that with is, and this is a very common question as an agency that we get all the time, is like, what should your budget be? You know, I, I want to start, I want to start social advertising. What should my budget be? And I typically will turn around and say, if you're not going into it with about a hundred dollars a day, so usually about three thousand dollars a month, it's gonna be tough. It's still doable, but it's gonna be tough and it's gonna be long going. And, and to me, it's the same thing as SEO. If you were to start SEO and you're like, I want to create one blog article a month, do a little bit of backlinking, and then that's about it. Like, okay, technically, yes, you can check the box if you've done SEO, but it's going to take you years to get that thing to do anything that you want it to do. Right. Social media, it's gonna be the same approach, right? If you're spending like 20 bucks a day and your average cost per click on Facebook is like a dollar 20, that means you're only getting 15-ish clicks a day. Now, unless you have a great conversion rate on your website and everyone's heard of your brand before, you're probably not gonna get anything and your ads are gonna turn off by 2 a.m. So unless you give it some room to work with, you're better off going in an organic direction. Um, what do you, do you recommend, do you have guidelines for people who are, they do have some money to spend, but they just don't know how to calculate how much they should spend? Do you, do you ever give any kind of uh, budgeting advice when it comes to that? Yeah, um, it still kind of comes down to dealer's choice because I, if you haven't done it before, you know, so let's say you want to go into starting Facebook ads, right? I'm a, I'm generally a, a conservative business person myself. So if I'm going into it, I'm going into it with the mindset of I'm not going to get anything out of this. I'm paying to learn and then I'm going to adjust and I'm going to adjust and learn as quick as I can. But that's my opinion. Usually that's never the case, but to me, that's how I look at it. For an e-commerce seller, it can be generally easy. It's just a matter of if you're willing to be patient enough to figure it out because you can look at what data you have available? What's your average order value, right? So uh, what's your what's your current website conversion rate? And then once you start running the ads, let them go for a little, like you can let them go for like a week or two. Now what's your average cost per click? You can figure out, okay, it's gonna take, it's gonna cost me X amount to get this many people to my website. 
X amount of those people are going to convert. That's my conversion rate. And I'm going to make X amount on each of those conversions because that's my average order value. And now once you actually start to grow the business and you know it starts to really start to scale out, what you're really going to want to look at is your lifetime value. So even though that one average order value might have been $20, if it's a consumable and they come back every month and over the course of a year, they shop with you, let's say six times, all of a sudden that $20 conversion where you broke even is actually really worth it because they're going to buy from you six more times this year alone. So there's a couple different things you can look at that way. But if you haven't run the ads before, you don't know what your conversion rate is from that channel. Your conversion rate from organic versus email versus SMS versus direct, they're all different. So you can start with a generalization and then break it down by channel and be able to get a general judgment on what you should expect from any channel based on those parameters. Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, I see we're, we're starting to we're starting to get uh, into the clock here, so I'm going to jump ahead to kind of a different topic we haven't touched on yet. Uh, drop shipping. Uh, someone has asked, is drop shipping lucrative? Um, and can it be used to grow a private label business? Yes, that's the, ooh, whoever asked that, thank you for asking that. <laughs> Dropshipping drives me insane. I personally don't really think dropshipping is lucrative. Um, I've never owned my own e-commerce business because I am horrendous at operations and inventory and it scares me and I don't wanna go near it, but I've been doing marketing for however long, but I keep looking into dropshipping because it's interesting. And I'm like, okay, that's just marketing. I don't have to do operations for that but it's not very lucrative unless you're doing, uh, your product has got to be, you know, probably well over a hundred dollar average order value to be able to make the profit dollars that you want. But I've always said exactly what that, that second part of that question was drop shipping to learn a market, then figuring out what's working and then private labeling that is very interesting to me. So I'll, I'll give you a, my exact example. Uh, my, Father recently retired, so all he does is golf. That's all the guy does. And I'm like, and so naturally I've started to play golf with him a lot more. And we started looking into creating a, a website that was selling all putters. People usually have several putters. Um, they'll kind of go back and forth on whether they want to change it. And there's a new one here, there's a new one there, and there's a ton of different companies for it. And my thought was if we drop ship all of the putters that we can possibly get, I can pull in the data on which one of these is most interesting and which one is actually getting used the most in certain regions, and then I'll just go private label it. And then if I can build a big enough community of golfers that are interested in putters, then all of a sudden, I just change my marketing to ignore some of those top sellers and replace it with my own. And now I'm private labeling them. And I can repeat that process from learning as I start to private label my own stuff, which is honestly like how most of these influencers start stuff anyway. Like Kim Kardashian didn't invent half the stuff that she's got. She just saw some, said like, these do well, here's how I can make it a little bit better, and then I'm gonna throw my name on it. So it's really not too much different. So uh, so influencer marketing, um, are, you, are you a fan? Uh, do you think it's worth the money and possibly the frustration of, of dealing mm -hmm. with, with this uh, way of going? That last part was a good point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, it can absolutely be worth it. You have to know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, social media, it, I always kind of look at it like this. If you were to drive your car into the into a lake and you were to go, this boat sucks. Well, yeah, it's not a boat. Social media is not really meant for sales. Influencer marketing is not really meant for sales. It's meant for brand awareness that yes, if you use it correctly, can then lead to sales. Influencers do not care if you convert. They don't care. That's not their job. Their job is to get you as many eyeballs as possible and then if they get to your website, they have no control over what your conversion rate is. They don't care. That's not up to them. Their job is to post, make it interesting, get a bunch of people to see it, and then they're done. So if you're going into it expecting to get sales, you're probably not going in the right direction. Now, I also think though it's very, very interesting for product launches. So if you're doing, let's say you're releasing a new product or maybe you're releasing a new brand, I actually start doing, I'll scrape a ton of influencers that I think are great. I'll reach out to all of them, send them the information on the new product and be like, here's something that we're creating. I'd love it to, to have your, in, uh, your insight on it, right? If you like it, it would be awesome for you to post about it. You don't have to pay them. You're just seeding, which is basically, I'm going to send you stuff and I hope you post. You mm. can pay them if, you have, if you've gotten to that size and you can pay them, then that's another option. But then what I do is I tell all of them, 
we're releasing it, you know, whatever on this day, I'm going to ship it to you a couple of days prior. You'll have it. I'm asking you to post during this time frame. And then if you can get as many influencers as possible to post during that time, the ones who were thinking like, oh, I'm not going to post about this because you gave it to free, gave it to them for free. They might be actually interested because they're like, wow, this thing's everywhere. And I got one. I want to show off that I got this thing. Or what's going to happen is they're all going to post like you want it to go. And it's all going to happen. It's going to cause this big snowball effect of all of a sudden it's all over the internet. When in reality, you just shipped it off to like 50 or 60 different influencers. And all it did was cost you your cost of goods. Right. Now, uh, I'm sure people are wondering, all right, that sounds great. Where, where do I find this list uh, of people to reach out to? Painstaking and it's scraping. <laughs> so usually this is where it kind of comes down to, it, it'll be dependent on where your business is at at the time. But if you can, that's one of those things like outsource it. You could hire a VA on Upwork or something and basically be like, okay, here's a handful of influencers that I think are exactly what we're looking for here, you know, spend whatever you're going to spend and be like on an hourly basis, go find me as many as you possibly can. And then you just put together terminology and, you know, the copy you want to reach out to them and be like, okay, reach out to all of them, document the day that you reach out to them. And then if they respond, just tell me they responded. Like, okay. They responded. Then you can take it over from there if you want. If they didn't respond, wait two or three days, tell the VA, be like, okay, go reach out to all these again and ask them, like double check with them and follow up. So to me, that's all process driven stuff that you could easily just have a VA do. Um, if you're getting to a point where you're paying them and there's negotiations involved and it's a little bit bigger, that's the point where either A, you're going to want to handle that yourself or B, you might want to have an agency or something do that. Um, so, so that's, that leads me to my next question. And also I just want to remind everyone watching, um, there is a questions tab. If you have any questions for Andrew, please, uh, stick them in there. Uh, we'll probably be wrapping up in the next 10 minutes or so, but I'd love to ask as many of your questions as possible. But, um, you know, is there a calculus for when, when should I outsource this stuff? Like, is it just comes down to, I just don't have time to do everything I want to do. Uh, how do you advise people that? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Obviously, as an agency owner, I come off a little biased. But the funny thing is, usually when I get asked that question, I go, "If you if you don't need to outsource it, don't do it." Like I, I'll get on calls with people all the time. They're like, you know, I have someone who you know is a uh, who's running my paid ads internally, and they do okay. But I'm thinking we should outsource. I go, look, if if you're happy with the results, keep it because it's hard to find good people who understand your business that can actually, you know, execute on it. To me, outsourcing is perfect once you have done. If you're going to a contractor, do it internally, get it to the, the a position that you want it in. Develop an SOP, right? So standard operating procedure. Here's do this, then this, then this, then this, and just document the whole thing, and then outsource it. That's the only way as an entrepreneur that you can free up your time is to find other people to do what you already know. Then you have the other side of it. If you don't know something, hire an expert, spend the extra money to get someone who knows what they're doing. So that's usually where I say like, okay, from an agency perspective, that's when it makes sense. But as soon as the agency has gotten to a certain point and now they're like, okay, I understand this is working, this is doing well. It's actually much less, and don't tell my clients I said this because they're going to end up doing, they're going to leave me. But basically at that point, you can be like, okay, now it justifies me bringing someone in-house to take over because they've already got it at a good spot. And we've learned what we needed to learn. Agencies or other experts, whether they're freelancers or something, they're, they have their ears to the ground at all times. So they learn stuff. They know what's going on. They're the ones who are going to allow you to learn faster. Obviously, it's going to cost you more, but you're going to learn faster. And then you bring it in-house. Like to me, social media is a big thing outsource it first, but then bring it in house because you're going to get better content internally than you will from any agency. And if you can, it's going to be crazy expensive. Uh, so we are starting to get some questions coming in from uh, the listeners. So thank you for that. Uh, I'll definitely ask you to keep them a little short because uh, we can't <laughs> read all these, but um, so Ralph Zerbonia wants to know, and maybe you can sort of expand on this, but I think he, he wants to know how he could reach old men is his target audience. But maybe you could talk a little bit about old men and also just finding your audience where uh, we, we touched on this earlier, but uh, maybe if you want to expand on that a little bit. 
<laughs> so it's going to be, and I, I know I keep repeating this, but it, it's the case. It, it's going to be dependent on the product line, right? If there's a old men, and I'm just picturing my dad right now, so I hope he's not <laughs> watching right now. They are, once they have a hobby or they have something they're really interested in, they tend to join like Facebook groups. So there'll be a Facebook group about like, my dad's a big bourbon drinker. He's a big golfer. And he's, uh, uh, he's getting a little bit more into like yoga. So he's in like a bunch of different Facebook groups around that stuff. So Andrew, Facebook that sounds pretty awesome. Let me just put that out there, but keep going. Thank you. Now I do hope he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, so Facebook's a good spot. The other thing is that I find very interesting that some people don't ever remember to look into. Bing is also really great. Good. I think people sleep on Bing. So, because Google is, you know, obvious. It's like 90% of the searches happen through Google. The other 10% are happening on Bing. And those people are typically not the most tech savvy because Bing comes preloaded on every PC. And if they don't know, like, oh, there's other browsers, there's other Google Chromes, there's like, you know, you get on Safari or something like that, they just deal with what they have. In which case, your older audience is typically on Bing. The other thing to do, because they're not usually on social, is going to be um, SEO. Anything you can do to write articles, they're always looking stuff up. My dad's always tinkering on things. YouTube is also an interesting approach um, because they're, you know, they, they don't know how to. He, what did he do? He broke something the other day, and my stepmom was losing her mind, and so he was on YouTube for hours with it. Like that's another way to go. So you kind of have to think of like, what type of old man are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> and then what are you selling? And then just, you'd have to kind of adjust it from there. <laughs> I hope great. you're watching this. <laughs> well, hope that, hope that answers your question, Ralph. Uh, <laughs> uh, if anyone else has any other quick questions, um, you know, I also want to remind everyone about the book. It's called uh, The Ultimate Guide to Shopify. You could find it on entrepreneur.com slash um bookstore is that there yes slash bookstore um and we have a discount code for you uh shop 20 so uh plug that in you'll get a nice discount on that you'll get a lot of this uh great information and andrew i guess uh you know what what's yeah. one of the things that you wish uh you hear from e-sellers all the time like what, what's the one thing you wish like everyone understood um, e-commerce is not what it once was, right? Like you used to be able to track exactly what your sales were from Facebook and exactly what they were from Google and, and your SEO, like you could, everything had an ROI. That is not the case anymore, especially for e-commerce. So one of the reasons that I would, I kind of explained the whole diversifying away from Amazon thing that all stemmed from six or seven years ago, I was watching my wife shop and she would go on Amazon, she'd find a product she was really interested in, and she would leave Amazon and go and Google them and try to find them. And she'd look at their social media presence and like she would want to know that they're a legitimate company that's selling on Amazon. And then I saw her do the other side of things where she would get a really cool Instagram ad and she would go to their website, but they didn't have a lot of reviews. So she would go to Amazon to see if they had more reviews there. So she was doing her own due diligence on who is this company and who am I shopping from, even if it was like a pair of pants. She was just still doing it. So the one thing that I've found with e-commerce sellers, you really need to look at your business holistically. So how much are you spending? How much are you making? Let's start there. Then go down a level. What of your two marketplaces? So you're on Amazon, maybe you're on Shopify. Right? Where are you making your money there? Where are you making your money here? And start to look at a little bit more really top level marketing specifically, because marketing, it's so fluid. People see stuff on Facebook and Instagram, and then they go and Google it. And then Facebook's taking credit for the sale, but so is Google. Yet Shopify couldn't track them because they had a known tracking on. So it's showing up as direct. Like, there's so many different ways that things can happen. Like you think traditional marketing back in the day, no one sat down and go, what's the ROI of my billboard? Be like, no one knows. Like there's right. no, you can't do that. And it's really not that different anymore. You can still track a lot more than you used to be able to. And I think we were spoiled for years that we used to be able to do that, but it's just not the case anymore. And and actually that's a, a good segue because I totally forgot too to piggyback off the book. Um, we have uh, on our site, and it was put in the chat here um, a little while ago, that uh, we put uh, 10 different um, 
uh, marketing reports we have like CRO audits, paid ad stuff, all that fun stuff. Usually we'd sell it. I just want to give it away. Everyone can have it, have at it. Do me a favor, email um, my colleague, Heather, H-E-A-T-H-E-R at Blue Tusker. She'll trigger it and send it to you. And then that way you have it. Um, it's to me, like a lot of this stuff comes from the 15 years plus I've been doing this of just like, okay, how do I get a spreadsheet together where I can actually track what's going on? Or, you know, or my biggest one, we have one on there is um, our master marketing document, onboarding a new uh, contractor after we've taught them something or bringing on a new client or something like, I, I need somewhere where I can like, hey, where's your brand voice guideline? Where's your customer profile? Where's your like one central place for everything? So we've got it all in there. Um, and we're giving away completely for free. Just email Heather and she'll uh, she'll send it to you. That's awesome. Sorry. Can you can you uh, <laughs> say that address one more time? Yeah. Uh, and it looks like they put it back in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but it's uh, Heather at Blue Tusker. So B L U E T U S K R dot com. Excellent, excellent. Well, I definitely encourage everyone to uh, jump on that because uh, that that's pretty awesome. You, you're giving that out. Uh, again, the book, uh, The Ultimate Guide to Shop to Shopify, can be found on entrepreneur.com slash bookstore and use the checkout code SHOP20 for a sweet discount. Andrew, thank you so much for this. Packed in a lot of great info there, uh, <laughs> including where to find old men. So this has been uh, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much. I hope I hope that that helped everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Thank well, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course, and thanks to everyone for watching and for your great questions. And this will be recorded and able to be rewatched and rewatched. So thanks again, and we will see you all again soon. Thanks so much. Have a good one.